Welcome to Linux for the Rest of Us, episode number 50. 50. The golden, it's our golden anniversary number show. Linux for the Rest of Us is that show where we bring Linux to you in many different ways, uh, varieties, avenues, in the form of news, distros, applications, all kinds of good stuff. And we do that with the help of, well, there's actually two people on the show today. And uh, I'll explain a little bit about what's going on, because you're probably not used to hearing my voice. First, let me introduce the man, the Linux maven, door-to-door -door geek, Steve McLaughlin. What's up, door? Hey, Steve. What's going on? Just uh, happy the long weekend's over, because actually, I do I, I feel more workish during the weekend than I do the week. More so workish? I, there, I have less free time. Ah. Uh. So I, I actually like when it's the work week, and I know... That's like one of the signs of the a, a, a apocalypse. <laughs> Hang on, Doc. I'm getting all kinds of noise from your headset. I'm sorry. I was shushing the granddaughter. Okay. And the man you have probably come accustomed to hearing, Larry Aldridge, a.k.a. Doc Brown, is with us tonight. What's up, Doc? <laughs> I, hey, what's up, guys? Uh, got a house full of people over here. Got my grandkids. I got my uh, son, my daughter-in-law. Having a regular riot around here. Right. So if you hear just a little bit of noise, that's because we've got some extra folks around. Uh -huh. But uh, to answer your question, I'm doing fine. Thanks for asking. No problem. How are you guys doing tonight? I'm good. Door expressed he's feeling workish. Yes, I heard. <laughs> well, I and I have things to do, so I feel good, but not too much to where I start going neurotic. No, I think it keeps you sane, keeping mm -hmm. busy, keeping busy. It's a good thing. Indeed. Uh, well, like I said, guys, about a month or so ago, when some of the other uh, people have jumped in to help me host some of the shows, um, I needed a little break. And um, I would like to say that without the help of these guys, um, it would be real tough to get rejuvenated again. But that's that's what happened. I'm going to be jumping back in as the host of the show. Um, Doc has been hosting and filling in, and he's been doing a great job. I really can't thank him enough for what he's done. I mean, it was uh, selfless, came in, did a great job. Um, so, Doc, I just want to like officially just give you a say thank you for letting me at least step back and take a breath and, uh, you know, get my bearings again. So uh, thank you very much for stepping in. Well, you're quite welcome, Steve. I uh, appreciate the opportunity to uh, fill in for you. And uh, quite frankly, uh, this is one more thing off of my plate. That's the way that uh, I've decided to look at it. And, uh, you know, he, the show is going to continue no matter who hosts it because it's really a door that brings all of the content. You and I are just the uh, Ed McMahon to uh, his Johnny Carson or whatever an analogy you want to use. <laughs> so I'm sure that as long as door is broadcasting uh, Linux for the left, uh, for the rest of us, it's going to continue. It's going to be successful. And you guys that uh, come for the Linux news and views are never going to be disappointed because uh, one thing Door does do is he continually brings the goods. So I'm going to uh, sign off as host of uh, Linux for the rest of us, turn it back over to the more than capable hands of uh, – Mr. Cherubino, the guy who started all of this. Steve, uh, if you ever need my help again, uh, I'm here. I will do with you, do for you whatever I can. You are the man. I, mean, it's truly, I appreciate it. Truly appreciate it from you, Doc. Tell us what you've been up to. I mean, tell us what, what you're going to be working on now that this is off your plate. I know you got some stuff the, in, you're doing right now that um, you might want to talk about as far as podcasting. Well, I appreciate the opportunity for you to uh, let me talk about this. Right now, uh, I am doing a podcast with uh, Lisa Hendrickson, uh, better known as Call That Girl, at callthatgirl.biz. It's a business and marketing podcast. In fact, the name of our podcast is called BAMcast. B-A-M stands, of course, for business and marketing. You can find our website at if I'm allowed to say this, at bamcast.biz. And you can pick up the shows from there, or you can look for us on iTunes. We're in the iTunes store as well. Uh, so far, we have done two shows. We're, we're on an every-two-week production schedule. 
And what Lisa and I endeavor to do is to bring uh, uh, business and marketing ideas to the owners of small uh, computer repair shops. And hey, that's just about all of us, I think, that's listening. And yeah. it's been pretty successful so far. I mean, as successful as a uh, two-show podcast can be, we've gotten some good comments and some, we've gotten some good questions and we're going to continue on. So uh, if you miss the sound of my golden voice, you can pick it up uh, on uh, reruns of uh, Linux for the rest of us or hear me new at bamcast.biz. That's B-A-M-C-A-S-T dot biz. And um, I look forward to seeing you there. And uh, Mr. McLaughlin, Mr. Dorr, I am going to leave you now in the more than capable hands of Mr. Cherubino. Mr. Cherubino, thank you again for the opportunity. I've enjoyed doing this, and uh, I will see everybody later. So long. Thanks for letting me be a part of this. Thank you very much, Doc. We'll definitely be talking to you. Appreciate it. Thank you, thank you Doc. You're welcome. My pleasure. See you soon. Bye, everybody. Doc Brown, everybody. Check out BAMcast.biz. Um, two shows. I've listened to both of them. Uh, amazing how much momentum, they, momentum they've gained in two shows. Um, it, uh, and I, I was impressed with, equally with both. So uh, check it out. I think you'll like it. We're all computer repair techs here. A lot of us anyway. Maybe not all of us. We're all yeah. geek. We're all geeks. It's good for geeks. Well, and to me, it's honestly good small marketing common sense that they throw out that I don't think of. And I like how they basically make it easier for me to understand because I'm not business savvy at all. Yeah. I, I And I, you know, a lot of us can relate to what they're talking about and because it, it fits for guys who are just starting up. You know, this isn't like spend $10 billion and put ads in every magazine. And, and you know what I mean? It's like, this is like startup stuff. It's good stuff that that uh, people, I think, would be interested to know. So they're doing Absolutely. a great job. Check it out. I have a feeling. I just have a feeling, Doc, this is not the only, this is not the last podcast Doc is going to be doing. I think he's yeah. going to be expanding. I, see, I feel it in him. I feel the urge. <laughs> so I hope he does, and I hope uh, you guys check it out and that he has success. All right, Dor, take it away. It's your show. Okay. Uh, first off, uh, I wanted to just, to jump back on the basic basic i'm kind of liking this i'm not gonna lie um one of the basic basic issues that i think comes up for every users of linux in any operating in any distro whether it's mint ubuntu peppermint whatever is you go to double click or highlight a file and hit enter and it doesn't do what you expect it to do uh for instance uh when you uh, hit a um, wine application or a .deb file in Ubuntu, when it's a clean install, occasionally it tries to run the archive manager. Okay. Yes. And it makes, that has and it makes no sense. No. None. That's when, that's when I give a call to door and say, what did I do? All right. <laughs> well, to be honest, this the way you troubleshoot this issue is the exact same way you can do it on windows okay the only difference is sometimes you need to know the exe quote unquote name we're in windows uh excel.exe well in linux it might just be the word wine you know for it. um what you got to do is basically very much like in windows right click the file and go down to open with and then you'll be presented with a list of registered applications with the operating system. And then on the very bottom, you will have a um, option to always, um, to uh, re, um, re uh, member this application for the future. Uh, now I have on the screen you... here, open with, uh, open with other application. Mm -hmm. Okay. And then towards the bottom, remember this application, I gotcha. Yep. And now sometimes your application you want to pick is not in that top list. Right. I will say that. But a lot of times it is, a huge amount of times it is. And if that is, you simply just click the application once, check the box, hit open. From now on, that file opens perfectly fine. Exact same thing 
in Windows when you have like a .log file. The first time you double click it, well, I don't understand what you want me to open with. And you can say, let me pick Notepad Remember Open. And it is almost exactly like Windows. Very, very fair. And to be honest, it's because it works. You know, it's a mm -hmm. simple upfront way of doing it. Now, occasionally, for instance, if the application was Wine and you know it's a Windows application, all you got to do is say, use a custom command if you don't see Wine in the list. And it's typically called Wine Windows Program Loader, which might not make a lot of sense to a, a new user, you can technically just hit the use a custom command, type in W-I-N-E, remember and open. If you're not sure that's it, just don't check the box. And you can go through the process again and figure out which application are you supposed to be running. Now, under all of this list is use a custom command. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, that's where you can type wine. Gotcha. Or 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 a different application name, like if it's a uh, .rtf document, but it's not being picked up right, that's where you can type in uh, the LibreOffice Writer application name. Gotcha. Um, to do that, and a super quick tip on how to find out applications names when you don't know the application name. Simply just run the application, and then in Ubuntu or Mint. In Mint, all you do is hit the Mint menu and start typing System Monitor. In Ubuntu, Main Menu, uh, System Ed, Administration System Monitor. This is exactly like the task list in Windows. So you can just simply scroll down. Most of the time, the icon, unlike in Windows, will, will be right next to that application and give you an idea of what the application is that that's running. So if you launch the uh, OpenOffice writer or the Libre Office writer, you simply scroll down to you see the correct icon and the word next to it is the actual executable name. I see. Yeah, that's really, really handy. That system monitor for the for discovery and how the operating system begins to work. Gotcha. That's a very useful tool. Um, and it's good to, I mean, it. it's it's good to, it, if for people jumping over from Windows, it'll be very familiar to them, as, as a lot of things actually are in Linux, as you talk about in your videos. Yeah. Um, you can make comparisons um, and really learn the OS fast. You know, let me just say one thing, um, because you did release your videos on how, on how to learn how to use Linux. I found, because I think a lot of people have this fear of afraid to learn a new operating system, too much info into one brain type of thing you know i already know this why do i have to learn this it's going to be t it's not it's like it's almost like if you know one os then you could learn another one so easy i mean that's what i did with mac when i learned windows i easily learned mac and then you knowing windows and mac you can more easily learn linux so it's not like starting from scratch it really there is really a lot of comparisons to be drawn so right yeah i was going to try to make the analogy if you know how to barbecue chicken you know how to barbecue pork yeah because really every operating system steals everything from each other. You know, maybe one out of four things, Windows invented, discovered, purchased, whatever. One out of four things, Linux might've started. One out of four things, BSD might've started. One out of four things, Mac might've started. And they all steal from each other. So realistically, if you're well-versed in any operating system, you're actually more than halfway to understanding the Linux desktop. Right. I'm with you. That's a great analogy. I was of, hoping kind, it was good. It kind of made me a little hungry. I was going to say I'm hungry, so I'm not sure if it was good or not. <laughs> okay. Um, first actual topic. Um, I've been getting this question a lot, a lot, a lot, a lot, and I'm really hesitant on how to answer because this almost has political implications to the gray beards. Um, what kind of maintenance do I need to do to my um, Linux PC? Dor, let me stop you for one sec. When you mm -hmm. say gray beards, I want everybody to know who's not watching the video that Dor has a gray beard. Exactly. Okay. Um, to the gray beards, <laughs> they just throw their hands up and say, what are you talking about maintenance to a Linux PC? There's no reason to do maintenance on a Linux PC. It maintains itself. It runs forever. What are you talking about? There are little things you can do 
And the biggest reason to do any maintenance on a Linux computer is you are in desperate need of hard drive space. That's really the, in my eyes, the primary reason to do it. Okay. There's no other reason to really do it unless you're just really bored and you think you're going to get an extra, you know, hundred score on the bench on the benchmark test or something. Right. Um, over at lifehacker.com, what kind of maintenance do I need to do to, to do on my Linux PC? That's the name of the article. They go through a couple commands and most of the commands there's more than a couple GUIs out there that really hold your hand to do these kind of things. You don't need to know the commands, but the beautiful thing is commands to a certain degree are cross distro. So you can literally just copy, paste, copy, paste, copy, paste, um, or copy them into a text file, run it as a script, bang, bang, bang. And really the very first command they give you is um, sudo apt get update and sudo apt get dist upgrade they're not maintenance and they're not maintenance i don't consider them maintenance at all i can i consider that more upkeep because that's when you're updating your flash from 10 to 10.1 what does it do it just updates all your apps it is updating everything in the repositories that you have installed that is applicable for a update well let me phrase that sudo apt get update merely refreshes your local listing. It goes to the internet, gets all the new data, the information for every application and refreshes your local app store, if you will. Gotcha. And then the dist upgrade actually goes out and pulls the applications and does the installs and the upgrades to the, the files. That's to me, not maintenance. I mean, maybe technically it is, but to me, that's more upkeep. Gotcha. Um, the next thing they go into is doing a backup to, again, to me, that's not maintenance. This is either standard operating procedure or something you do once in a blue moon. Um, the next one is really, here's where you start getting into it. Clean up temporary files. They give you like four or five commands. Most of them really delete most of your true temp files in like the ver VAR folder that can get loaded with temp files. If you're running a task, then you leave and that task goes berserker. It will have the potential to fill up your VAR folder, i.e. fill up your hard drive, which is why sometimes on critical systems, they make multiple partitions, one for the boot, one for the home, one for the VAR. So you can fill up that VAR partition all you want. You're not going to crash the operating system. It will still be bootable. But most home users will leave it all on the same one. So once in a while, cleaning out that VAR is good. So on the Lifehacker article, this is the first thing that you feel is actually upkeep, or, um, upkeep maintenance. Yeah, but at the same token, I know people who've ran the same install for five years and they never cleaned their VAR folder. So, And was that a reference to Clerks, by the way, Berserker? A little bit. Okay, good. So just a coach. Um, but again, if you are really tight on hard drive space, these are the kind of things you need to have to sustain because you'll go to do an update or a disk upgrade and it will fail because you're out of hard drive space. Um, hmm. The last two I say to uninstall, these are the real gems of cleaning up space because everybody knows there's many applications on a computer that no one ever uses. You can simply go in, do a, uh, a sudo apt get purge or a sudo apt get remove. They do slightly different things. Um, one of them r does remove custom settings, which are typically really teeny, tiny, teeny, tiny file sizes. But if you're looking for every single meg, this could help. Uh, after that, they say defrag no. Ever since ext2, I believe, maybe I'm wrong. D file system there's two ways you can look at it you can either be optimized for speed or optify optimized for per for performance when it comes to hard disk ntfs windows focuses on performance i'm a hater because there's so much bloat they have to try to get every bit of performance out they can because of that the way files are distributed on the hard drive they are fragmented to um, 
sacrifice for speed. So to be fast, oh, just put it here, just put it here, hurry up, hurry up, hurry up. Linux does the opposite. It is actually slightly slower on the disk IO with ext4 especially because it does such a careful job of putting your file in one big chunk on the hard drive. It also means the gap be, um, be between files is technically a little bit bigger. So it's easier to look like you're using more space than you actually are. Not a lot, mind you, you know, maybe like 1%. So you really, there's, to defrag is totally pointless. And there, if there is a defrag command, I never heard of it, but you can run what is like a uh, check disk. Uh, uh, they call it F-S-C-K, files check, I guess. File, file system check. Yes. Um, but it's actually a, uh, what they first take you through is understanding the disk partitions and stuff with Ubuntu and Mint. You don't have to worry about it. Once every 30 reboots, it automatically runs a um, FS check. Wow. So it's you don't done. have to really worry about it once every 30 times. And here's the gimmick. Unless you have like 80% of the drive filled in my experience, it goes really quick. I mean, super quick, like three minutes at the most quick on a 100 gig laptop drive. Okay. And after that, they just give little bits of really advice, not maintenance. But this, I think, is a really good intro to base understandings of Linux. And I love the fact they do some Windows comparisons in here. Like, what about the um, registry? No. What about the um, cleaning up the cruft left behind by a a applications? No. What about updating your antivirus? <laughs> uh, re rebooting after you install anything, it seems like? No. To actually go through things like that, and that's what I really appreciated about this article. Just because it said, what kind of maintenance do I need to do? Read it. It's still good stuff. Awesome. That is good stuff. Yeah. Firewalls, graphic drivers, they really go pretty uh, pretty deep for a life hack yeah. article. Well, there's obviously a couple guys at Lifehacker that really like their Linux. Right. Yeah, that's, to me, kind of, ooh, obvious. <laughs> um, Great article. The, right. At, now, this next tool, I almost, I never really needed. I had a friend online that needed it really bad, so we had to do some searching. With an ISO file in Ubuntu and Mint, you simply, I believe, just right-click the file, and you can mount it right there. If the... If the um, ISO is called Windows XP, that ISO file, and it's on your desktop, you right click, say mount, right on your desktop, there'll be a folder called Windows XP.ISO. Can you explain mount? Because that's a kind of a new concept to Windows people, I think. Yeah. I know it was uh, for me when I started using Linux. Right. Think of mount as the official invitation to browse or access a CD ROM, a thumb drive, a DVD drive, a network drive or virtually access an ISO file like it's a file system. Um, you can do the same thing with like zip files and other formats, but most other formats, it's really easy to do right in the interface. But hmm. when you use um, Clonezilla and then a couple other tools, it actually uses DD to make a direct duplicate copy, I think it is on it. And the files are called IMG files. And I had no way to tell this guy how he could browse the I IMG file until I found furious ISO mount. And it's at uh, launchpad.net. Really simple, great tool. You open it up, you browse to the .img file, click it and say mount. And when you mount, the exact same thing happens. It creates a folder in that same directory where that IMG file is, and it allows you to browse and copy out of that IMG file any files you want. Nah, uh, that's pretty easy. It's free, I assume. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, and they do have a .dev file, so it makes it much easier to implement on Ubuntu Mint those the distros. Good stuff. Furious, F-U-R-I-U-S, from launchpad.net. Yeah, it's the kind of thing if you need, you need bad. Yeah, right. So I highly encourage people to bookmark this and bookmark it with the title um, ISO, IMG, BIN, MDF, and NRG mount. Because they're all image files 
Yep. And they're all the different file types. Okay. Neat. Yeah. Yeah, that's one of those tools where you go. You don't. It doesn't come to you. You go searching for it and hope you find exactly. something. Exactly. Exactly. Cool. Um, the next thing I want to talk about really is just a squishy. It's at uh, LinuxFordevices.com. Where if you go there, I will admit it's ultra hard to circumnavigate the site and to find stuff up to date. It seems like what was posted five years ago and what was posted today is like side by side and it's kind of hard to tell <laughs> really so if you want to find this out go to the google um uh, site colon lennox devices.com space lennox based network dvr can record from 64 cameras okay the main reason i'll talk about this is because i have a little bit of experience in this um i assisted very lightly, but I assisted uh, in my nine to five job setting up a total of three, 400 cameras or so, uh, 20 at this uh, office, 20 at this office, 30 at this office kind of thing. It cost mega, mega cash. And every device we had, it could either only record to like 12 or 16 cameras out of whack, or at a very high quality eight, which meant we had to buy a lot of hardware, a lot of hardware. More hardware means more possibility for failure in the business world. So when I saw this, it's one unit, one device that can record up to 64 cameras and it has built in uh, two terabytes of capacity, uh, which you can technically get pushed up to six terabytes of capacity this is really needed by higher end people who want to do quality recording of video, whether it be for the galaxy's purpose or you're just paranoid. <laughs> um, this is the kind of thing people need. And I'll say the only system out there that even is, exists that you can put embedded into a device and have the raw power to customize to record 64 streams like that is Linux. Um, without Linux, I don't see how this thing could even be dreamed of. So it's a standalone device. It's a rack mount device, right? You don't hook this up to a monitor or anything? Nope. Nope. And you have software that can access it where you can fast forward, re rewind, switch cameras, the whole nine. Very cool. I'm going to tell these babies run. They won't even tell you. Um, I can tell you, I guarantee you, <laughs> price per camera, it's still a lot cheaper than what is normally purchased out there for real enterprise-grade recording, because that's what this really is. This is really meant for big businesses to be able sure. to record. Well, for 64 cameras, yeah. Right. And they really have, like, three devices they daisy-chained together for... The cameras, expanded storage, and then for like the streaming uh, capability back to computers. So it really does end up being like an all-in-one kind of solution. What's the company? Indigo Vision. Okay. Yep. Indigo Vision. And the product is a NVR-AS3000. Um, honestly, really promising looking device. Uh, I definitely showed it to my uh nine to five and i really like the uh range of temperature it was uh 32 degrees to 140 degrees fahrenheit i think that's a little bit wider of a range than what we currently have and that's always just a plus sure because if power goes out or something you at least have a little bit of buffer yeah it's really cool yeah i just thought that was really cool it looks hardcore <sighs> power power is one thing i can think of beefy mm -hmm. um and then, to be honest, I wanted to go over something I consider to be bad news, stupid, incompetent from Canonical or Ubuntu. Can we? Hey, before we do that, that was a teaser. Mm -hmm. That was a teaser, I know. Let me throw an ad in. We've got to do an ad here. Um, because we have a good product, and we only advertise stuff that we actually use and believe in. Uh, I'm going to do the Fabs ad. Is that cool, Dor? Absolutely, because if people don't like saving time, then... You know, I feel sorry for him. 
<laughs> in case you guys haven't heard, I'll just read the script I wrote for this. In case you guys haven't heard, Fab's Auto Backup 4 for technicians was recently released and has breakthrough improvements over the already amazing Fab's Auto Backup. Fab's Auto Backup is a key program for PC technicians needing to back up customers' data and transfer it to new machines or installations. This new version is mostly designed for professionals like computer repair shops who need to back up data for several users' accounts at once or to save data from unbootable computers, two things that technicians rarely need to do a lot. Uh, like Fab's Auto Backup 3, it makes the backup and restore tasks easier. The program handles the backup and transfer of emails, documents, and much more. The PodNuts guys are going crazy about it. See what all the buzz is about and find out more at podnuts.com slash fabs. F-A-B-S. Podnuts.com slash fabs. Um, that was the scripted version. Now just the, me talking about it. Um, I used fabs in my shop. I wish I would have had fabs auto backup for because it allows you to back up multiple user accounts at once. That's the main thing about it. So yeah, definitely check that out guys. Yeah. And I, and I love the fact you can run it from like a windows PE bootable environment. So if the drives even unbootable, you can literally back up all every type of data. Any user could possibly want backed up with one click for all the users on the computer. If you care at all about time, if your time is at all valuable and you do more than like one reinstall a week, you really need to honestly invest in yourself, invest in your own personal time and get this at podnuts.com slash fabs. Thank you, Dora. And I have a great segue. Yes. In the same respect of how fabs is a all in one tool that takes complicated tasks and it basically simplifies and automates them with very user with very little user interaction right if linux did not have a package management system it would be a tumor to get software on and off the system and every time you would Basically, you would forget stuff because you would go to install a VLC. Oh, I forgot to do MP3 support. You know, same kind of thing with Fabs. You backed up this. Oh, I forgot to back up that. With a package manager, it does it all for you. Now, hmm. technically speaking, Linux is shipping right now with two, two, two GUI package management systems. It's actually shipping with three, and you could put a fourth on there. Hmm. But two are command line. Let me guess. Sol the software center? And a the snappy, software and yeah, a snappy they, package manager. Right. They love um, Ubuntu Software Center because it has in there not only... Who loves uh, it? Canonical? Well, canonical because it has also in there paid applications. Okay. So you can very easily with one click go in there and buy an application. Canonical only gets, I want to say, like 5% of the money. So it isn't like they're getting a lot of money, but it's better than nothing. Yeah, they'll change that, I'm sure, for them. Well... And I do agree having two on the system can be kind of confusing to people, right. but I don't care. <laughs> the flexibility, the amount of detail I get with Synaptic Package Manager blows the software center away. Uh -huh. it, if you compare checklist, like old on the back of a friggin' Norton box checklist, right. features and functionality, Ubuntu Software Center will be like 10 deep. Synaptic Package Manager will be like 30 deep. Now you can put it back on. This isn't going to happen, I believe, until um, um, the next version released in October. But you can go back into the software center and reinstall Synaptic. But to, for me, to take it out is really bad. There's no way they're saving that much disk space on their ISO file. There's yeah. no way Synaptic is that big. I don't think it's because of disk space. Can I ask you something, Dor? Now, mm -hmm. this might be... You're a Ubuntu user. I mean, that's what you use on your your main box, right? Um. Most of them, yes. Not recently, but yes. Okay, because this is, I would think that between um, Unity and now killing Synaptic Manager, Manager, is that like strike two? Are you not going to use Ubuntu? Do you foresee yourself not using Ubuntu in the future? Or? Well, no, and here's the reason why. I'm always going to have an install of what I consider to be the best blend of new user experience with the amount of power I can get out of the system. Gotcha. I can always go back into Ubuntu and starting with the next version, I can install GNOME gotcha. or I can install Synaptic Package Manager. That's the beauty of Ubuntu is if they start doing things wrong, distros like Linux Mint and other 
Ubuntu, uh, Ubuntu spins will just get more traction. I see. I but they're see. still going to be feeding off the Ubuntu core because honestly, the money Canonical has been putting into this operating system is helping the entire Linux universe, right. whether some people want to believe it or not. And they're so probably they're probably not going to butcher the core too bad. Okay, so you said, and so you th you're still going to use it. Good. Yeah. For the biggest reason of when people ask me questions, I have to be able to answer them. Right. The last thing I want to say is, well, did you search Google? Because <laughs> that's just mean to me. Good answer. Um, well, and now, you know, Ubuntu is kind of, I don't want to say limiting choices, but what they're saying is it, it's the dumbing down of the initial experience for the end user. I'm giving end users the opposite. Uh, at um, Tech Drive-In, there's a really good posting, A, because it has nice screenshots. Yes. And and two, really good, quick, short, descriptive write-ups. And it's nine good terminal emulators for Linux. Um, I can safely say the terminal, the command line, the console, there's like eight more names for it where it looks like the old DOS window where you can type commands. That's what this is. There's actually a bunch of different programs you can run to give you a little bit of a different customized look, feel, or action in the terminal. The first one is Quake. I love Quake. If anyone played Quake, you could hit F12 and a screen would literally slide down from the top where you could type certain things. I think that's how you could chat too, maybe. Well, they made Gwake, G-U-A-K-E. You hit F12 on your keyboard, and the command line slides down. This is what I like about it. You can type a command, and if it's going to churn for a while, you just type it, hit Enter, hit F12 again. It slides up out of the way, and it's doing everything in the background. Oh, man. You, you can easily keep doing what you're doing. Hit F12 to check in on it again. And if you need full screen, F11, I believe, will make it go full screen. So I'm a big fan of Gwake, just because... I like the fact it's, to, you know, hit it, bang, 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 hide it, you know, and then do what you're doing. Hmm. Um, the other ones, I really want to only highlight one other one, and it's the next one on the list. It's called Terminator. Yeah. First off, that's a great name. <laughs> For Terminal? Yeah, because all of the apps we had with bad names, this starts to make up for it. <laughs> okay, this, 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 this just starts to just go up a little bit more. Um the best thing about this one is command uh, shortcuts, where I believe it's Control and S will split the terminal window, because uh -huh. because most of the space in the terminal window you as an end user really don't need. Okay, so you can technically split horizontal and vertical, and then split again the other way, and then split again the other way. You can split a whole bunch of different ways, and then have multiple terminal sessions inside the one main window right. i really like that if you need to do more than one thing at a time that's a really nice way to do it in quake there is a way to do multiple terminals as well to me it's just not as fluid i see um and there's plenty of other ones there to look at i highly encourage people to go check it out um because with this whole thing of Linux, it's all about what do you like? What fits your need? Right. So there's nine good, healthy choices. And it's just a skin for Terminal? That's pretty much all it is? Most of them are application layers over top what's called the Bash Terminal. Mm -hmm. And it allows for sometimes extra color effects, sometimes key commands to do extra special things, and sometimes actually can extend what kind of things you can type in there. Neat. Yeah. I like it. Hey, anything to dress up terminals, a plus point. Ding. Exactly. <laughs> okay. Um, now, if you want to talk about dress up, mm -hmm, <laughs> I got I, I got the hookup. Okay. It's at Juanza. <laughs> Wanza. No, you had it, man. Juanza. Or no, no. Do not. Well, wait. This is a tough one, isn't it? Yes. J U N A U Z A. Junauza. Wow, Junauza. J U N A U Z A. Okay. T terrible website right. of name. Sorry. Damn, I just moved down a notch. It's going to be in the notes, okay? <laughs> but this should at least make up for a little bit. Yes. Conky. Conky's a thing I kind of teased about a little bit here and there, showed yeah. a thing here and there about it. 
This is 15 really awesome Conky configurations. Okay. The best way I can explain Conky, it's a totally non-suck version of Windows 7, Windows Vista, desktop screenlets or whatever they're gadgets. called. Gadgets. Widgets, gadgets. And in Mac OS, they had the one that Yahoo bought that were kind of cool, but they were a little bit heavy from time to time. Conky is super, super absurdly, ridiculously light. I have never seen it actually affect the processor. The most I've seen was uh, percentage-wise 0.01% of the processor. And RAM... 0.01? You serious? Yeah, and the amount of RAM it used was something like, you know, 60K. It was so low. And I'm sure I'm way over it's so low. But it's you're basically talking about widgets and gadgets on your desktop. It's... Think of it as um, display output of anything on your computer, anything that your computer can gather. And Conky has different formats of beautification. Most of it is either make this image, put it here, wrap it around it, and then put the text inside with this style text to make it look like, for instance, the Star Trek interface, which I'm sorry, Steve, that's cool. Um, it can give you seriously anything any bit of information you can get out of your computer hard drive capacity hard drive fill rate disk io rate disk temperature network traffic network speed um network throughput cpu temperature cpu speed uh cpu like threshold how much is it using time of course i mean Anything you can imagine, it can be displayed. And these are just 15 different types of interfaces that people made up. And the best thing about Conky is the core of it is really just one text file. It's called Conky RC, I believe. Yeah. You just copy that and put it in your folder, in your home folder called Conky. And you're halfway there. Next is the images. Typically, you just download them. And most people sites i've seen give you very good descriptions of where to put those files now nah, these Virtually. are really nice yeah yeah and I, what i love is they're not your desktop okay you can, and everyone i've seen you really can't click on even huh. it's like a static part of your desktop that's an overlay above your background it's above your background, below the clickable surface, and it has a refresh rate. So you can say refresh every five seconds, 10 seconds, one minute, or whatever. Wow, that's super badass. Yeah. I'm in love with Conky just because of its versatility. This is an addiction because <laughs> there is there is no end to it. And if you just search Google for Conky scripts or Conky configs, you will find entire websites devoted to stuff people uploaded and said, here's mine. What do you think? <laughs> wow. There's a lot, even on just these 15 are killer. Yeah. And the best way I can put it is that is not even a drop of a drop of a drop of a drop in the bucket. For, of Thing, what Conky can do, you mean? Uh, uh, of, of the different types of styles Conky can display in. It's um, amazing. Knucklehead Tech has a real good desktop i just gotta say this it's darth vader standing from like his hips up and you just see him standing there with his arms crossed and then next to it in black and i think silver or black and white he has a conky config showing all kinds of information next to him <laughs> got it you said knuckle yeah knuckle, knuckle send us a screenshot of that it is at linuxbasics.forums if i can find it you keep, quickly, you I will keep rolling. I'll go. I'll check it out while you do that. Okay. Um, I believe it is called Show Us Your Desktop. Um, okay. The next one is the five best Linux distributions for desktops. Now, this is a very biased thing. This is just what the editors decided to put together. And it's at ZDNet, who kind of have a talent of manipulation for clicks, like they got mine. But I will say I do agree with most of these choices. Um, the number five, though, is not a desktop distribution at all. It's called System Rescue CD. What this is, this is a Ubuntu-based, non-GUI, command-line-only rescue CD that 
is supposed to make it easier for you to put it in a non-booting computer or a really infected computer, copy files off, reset Windows passwords, uh, repair partitions, create partitions kind of thing. I personally don't appreciate the fact that it's like the old Trinity back in the day where you would boot it up and it would just be a blinking cursor. What? You know, and you really weren't sure of what to do. Now, that might have changed. I haven't tried this in like eight months. But the last time I tried it, you basically had to have a second computer opened up on their website to see what the, it could do and what you were supposed to type. So, so this is like that. So it's not really a Linux desktop, but it's a cool, but cool tool. Yeah. It, yeah, it's cool. And I do think it should deserve an honorable mention. I don't think it should be in the top five. Yes, yeah, so it's System Rescue CD, it's called? Yeah. Gotcha. Um, the number four one, OpenSUSE 11.4, and I will say, without a question, I do not give OpenSUSE the credit it deserves. It really is an ultra-solid, ultra-polished distribution of Linux. I just don't like it. That's all I can say. I just It just doesn't, you know, get my goat going or something. Um, but it's good, and I highly encourage people out there who are who are just experiencing Linux, put this on a second computer, put it on a thumb drive, boot to the live CD, poke around it, see if it has, see if the path to get things done makes more sense to you because there's no reason why. If it does, you, you um, shouldn't use it. I'll say that. Hmm. Um, number three, M MEPIS, M-E-P-I-S 11. Never used it. I've heard great things about it. Never really had the need to use it. Never heard of it. And here's where it gets a little controversial. Number two, Ubuntu 1104. I don't think it should be number two. Well, yeah, okay. Number one, Mint 11. They ranked a derivative of a distribution higher than the distribution itself, which I think is going to lead to a lot of clicks to this website. Yes. I, I do foresee a day when Linux Mint could be more popular than Ubuntu just for new user ease of useness. Totally. Something. I installed Linux Mint on a noob's laptop. Or a guy who just, he wanted, all he wanted to do was watch videos on the thing. That's all he wanted to do. I installed Mint. He never had a problem. He freaking loved the thing. So. Yeah. Well, that's the thing. You have very good odds of it recognizing all the hardware. And with Mint, that is the only real issue you can have to usability. If it picks up the Wi-Fi card, the Ethernet card, and the video and the sound decent, you're home free. There's nothing else you really have to worry about. You can just install it and move on, you know? Yeah, it's true. It looks great, yeah. too. Yeah, it's really, they did a really good job of keeping it polished, keeping it, keeping everything as smooth looking as possible. Um. The next one I want to go to is from omg.ubuntu.uk. Again, I don't think these people can count very well, but it's a good posting. <laughs> the top, it, it is the top five terminal commands everyone should know. Now, with that said, you can literally run Ubuntu or Mint for months and months and months and never have to drop to the terminal once. I mean that in all sincerity. You really never have to. The only time you have to drop to the terminal is when you're in the middle of an update and something breaks or you're following an online tutorial where they're telling you to go to the command line. For the majority of use case, you really don't need to. I, I will reiterate that again, but it is definitely important in my eyes to know of its existence and to know some basic things to get around okay. uh, their number one is two commands um sudo apt get update we'll talk about that one earlier the next one is gk sudo space nautilus that's a gk sudo space nautilus what this does in mint it's right there i believe off of the tools menu in nautilus if you open any file browser and you're looking at, you know, my documents or something in Mint right off of the, I think, Go menu or the Edit menu. 
There is a launch current folder as admin right in the main menu. This is not in Ubuntu. So if you need to browse the file system as the root user, the super user, GK sudo means in the GTK graphical environment, prompt me for super user do. So you'll get a GUI window pop up asking for your password. Once you supplied it, Nautilus, the file browser will be launched and you will have true root access. That's where you must be careful. You can severely, quite easily damage your system. Uh -huh. um, the number two is the CD command, which should make a lot of sense after using it for 30 seconds. It's just change directory space directory name of where you want to change to. It's basically like um, tra um, tra Versing your file system, going to this folder, then seeding to another folder, then seeding to uh, another folder. Like, win like Windows. Right. And the only other thing you got to know, CD space dot dot means go up a parent folder backwards or CD space tilde slash. I think you need the slash after the tilde. We'll take you back to your home folder. Tilde is next to the number one on the American keyboard yes. above the above the tick, the back tick, I think it's called. Um, number three, ls command, list command, shows you the files command, everybody needs that. Four, sudo apt-get install. I don't know why that wouldn't be up by sudo apt-get update, but it isn't, <laughs> I'm not arguing. What does it do? And, uh, that's how you install applications. If you know the application name or um, you have a good idea of how the program name starts. It's also how you can uninstall if you do sudo apt git remove. Uh, their example is sudo apt git space install space chromium dash browser. That will install the open source version of Chroma on, on the computer and put the menu choices in and a bunch of other things. Neat. Now this last one is pure gold to know. You name space dash a. I don't know what the U in U name stands for. I think of it as universal name, and the A dash A makes it kick out more human readable information. I'll say when you type that, it tells you the um, computer name and uh, the version of the computer and the uh, kernel version as well. Um, so somebody says, what kernel are you running in, in, in Linux? And you go, oh, <laughs> here's a quick way you can get it. You can just U-N-A-M-E space dash A. That is a handy command. I will say that again. Very good stuff. Yeah. I like I this, man. I could digest this ter these terminal commands. These are, I can relate to them. I can use these. Well, I ain't going to lie, Steve. Uh, me, Knucklehead Tech, and a couple of guys are contemplating the possibility of putting together a command line site and a command line podcast, but it would be a very slow endeavor from you just learned English kind of intro to a very slow, methodical rate of more complex command line commands. I think it's a but great gimmick, idea. Well, but the gimmick will be some people... A lot of people are ADD and they be like, I just want to know about this one command kind of thing. So the site would have to have a like a like a tagging system where you could say, show me every command in relation to copying files or moving files, you know, right. in relation to things. Right. And then they could just look at those. It's just something we're thinking of. It's a question of time. That's cool. And that's like, a cool name for a podcast too, the command line. Well, they have one called the command line oh. and it has nothing to do with the command line <laughs> because I subscribed to it in like four weeks in, I'm thinking, I'm really getting tired of this guy just blabbering his mouth off. Am I, am I going to get to commands here soon? So I went and looked at the website and they don't talk about command line commands at all. You know what? Just make one anyway. Call, well, call it that anyway. Knuckle wanted to call it terminal basics, B-A-S-I-X, I think. That's cool. I can't. I'm horrible. Speaking at names. speaking of Knuckle, I did find his uh, screenshot of Darth oh, cool. Vader, and oh, yeah. is... he he's proud of that thing. <laughs> that's pretty awesome. <laughs> yeah, that's just good stuff. That is good stuff. I know. I can and appreciate that. Artist. Fedora there. Oh, Fedora, sweet. Yeah, that's a little F in the bottom right hand corner. Neat. Good one, yeah. Knuckle. Good one. 
very not yeah and he's like me he loves just give me information give me the information so i can read it so he can see if something is going out of control in his computer or up oh, right. hard drive space is getting low right you know copy the stuff off huh. awesome. okay and if no one has figured it out yet we've had a heavily numbered podcast today for number 50 we had uh 64 cameras we had uh, nine good terminal emulators, 15 conky, five best desktops, five top five uh, terminal commands. And we're carrying that tradition on to the eight <laughs> best free Linux a, a, uh, astronomy apps. What is this, like Sesame Street? No, this is like education, like honestly, high school, college level. No, well, I mean, I now, mean, not with that. Not for, I mean, oh. I mean all the numbers. Well, I didn't put them in order. Maybe if I put them in order, and if I two, three, <laughs> the count. Uh, uh, uh. Oh, that one video. You're the one who showed me that one video of him counting. It's the song, and they bleep out the word. I love uh, count. They bleep out the word count. Yeah, I, it's called the I count sense. Yeah, but I didn't. I, I can't take credit for that. That's all Matt Rainey. He's the one who uh, told me about that. That um, is gold. If I know. if especially if you are at all familiar with the count you have to watch that video yeah it's awesome yeah the, what is this one the eight best free linux astronomy apps yeah now i'll say some of these are very geared very focused very small niche of astronomy and when i say astronomy i literally mean the mapping of the stars um what do they call it again with uh you know star big dipper, little dipper well the big dipper the little dipper orion's thingies. belt Oh, constellations, uh, constellations, constellations, and that kind of thing, amongst other things. To me, the application that really shined when I could have looked at it more than a couple of these was Solarium, and I and I put more than a couple. Uh, I put a link to a page with more than a couple of screenshots. What I really liked is this application also had the ability. It's like group sourced, where they took pictures that people took on the moon, and they mapped out the things in the background um you can put in different times you can also do like a time travel to where you can say well on this night of this week of this month of this year mars will be right there you know i thought that was really cool and it gives a really good um can't remember the word of it planetarium where you can like gaze and you know, zoom in, zoom out of right. the of the sky to get a little bit of a good, a, be, a better understanding of the sky. It and honestly, to me, it looks like Google Sky or it's called Earth? on the Android phone. Uh, no, it's the one uh, look, uh, to look uh, at stars. By looking at some of these screenshots, it looks like that's where they got their ideas from. Really, from Stella this Stellarium. That looks pretty awesome. Yeah, and I'll say, granted. It might only apply to one or two percent of the people l listening that might think this is cool or go or want to go look at it. Go look at the notes if you need these notes. I care about you too. <laughs> um, okay, last really link of the night. I so want to see exchange go down in flames because I've dealt with it and I really hate it. I think it's clunky. I think it's bloated. I think it costs way too much money for what it does. For the most part, it's archaic technology we're dealing with. Email has been around for 30 plus years. You know, there ain't much more you can do with it. Well, Zimbra who I'm 99% sure was owned by Yahoo, was very recently sold to VMware. VMware, if people don't know, are buying everything that they can get their hands on for the last, like, two years. Are you serious? They are buying everything possible. They want to become the place you go to as a small business, big business, you go to to complete every need you could possibly need in your business. And this is one thing they're trying to do by buying um, Zimbra, which is um, Zimbra, is just an open source exchange uh, program. Basically, it's an open source exchange and Outlook web access like utility tool. Um, it does do a little bit more. It actually does stuff with documents as well. So it's really kind of like Exchange plus Office plus SharePoint. 
gotcha. kind of thing. Gotcha. Which for an enterprise, I can safely say for hypothetically 2,000 users would cost you well in excess of $15 million to run because, I mean, you have to buy seats for everybody who's going to use it and all this kind of thing. This is completely free. And it's going to be completely optimized to run in VMware where you're going to have basically a customized OS Zimbra where it's going to do great with the memory management and stuff. And I think it's kind of funny, the the Wall Street Journal, I don't listen to anything money-related, money-wise, business-wise, because I have no idea what's going on. <laughs> but when the Wall Street <laughs> Journal basically says Office 365, which is going to be out very shortly, I believe, very shortly, which is their online competitor to Zimbra. Um, it's basically like hosted Exchange and hosted Office all in one where you don't have to install office on your computer. You can access it remotely and pay Microsoft forever for it. <laughs> um, they say office 365 enters a crowded field, Google docs from Google and VMware's Zimbra email for example, are a, are a, are a attracting hundreds of companies seeking tools that work from their desktop computers, smartphones, or, from the growing number of tablet computers in use today. Microsoft's biggest competitor, however, may be itself. Meaning they typically have to destroy one part of their business to get another part of their business to grow. Right, right. That's very. That's one of the very constants that Microsoft has not done well. Um, but I will say the, Microsoft, the Wall Street Journal acknowledging Zimbra is in the same league to me that's big props onto itself wow i have very little doubt that this will be a very um this will be a powerhouse in the future when it comes to especially small business and medium-sized businesses to have their um to have their email their word docs their excel spreadsheets and their calendars all that because this is very easy to implement as your quote unquote personal cloud. Yeah, but Dor, I mean, VMware is not a. I bought some VMware products. They charge for their products. Are they going to make Zimbra pay for paid product now? Or? Well, I can tell you, you can download a VMware server right now for free. You can download the Zimbra Office Suite completely for free and implement it yourself where you're really paying. You, you would only have to pay for the hardware, really. Now, I will tell you, they will make it enticing for companies to buy proper support for it, because that's really where they're going to make their money. Okay. Uh, and what it's going to be, I'm sure, is something to the effect of when you buy your vSphere cluster licensing, that's to run the big dog stuff, you can get Zimbra for what's going to amount to like 2% of what you paid at no cost, wow. you know, pu pushed into it. And then where they're going to make their money is they're going to offer for very low rates, kind of, um, kind of consultants to come in to help with the transition from other office email suites to the Zimber office suite. I see. Yeah. I got to say, I'm really tempted. I don't know why I haven't done it yet to install Zimber on my local land here just to play with it because your personal cloud is so important i'll say for business you own that data you own that server you control that server businesses love to point the finger so when they say we have an issue it's your fault right. you fix it now right. when it's out there in the ether in the cloud they don't know who to point the finger at they don't like that hmm. you know and to quote matt rainey it comes back to control control ensures when something does go wrong you are the correct person to be called upon to fix the issue. When it's your personal cloud, you have complete control over everything. So I, I believe it's going to be only growing. And I think what they're going to start doing very soon, all these companies are start to offer lower priced a appliances. What I mean by that is really small devices, not big at all, smaller than Mac minis, for instance, where you can put in a room and that will be your Zimbra server right. or, you know, this server or that server where you never have to log into it. 
to do anything just works automatically stays up to date and keeps rolling that's a good idea and best of luck to zimbra i mean be nice yeah okay very nice thing i want to talk about i'm not running ubuntu now on two of my computers uh -oh. and it's pure coincidence Honestly, I, I I quite frequently do just install stuff, just to install stuff. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Yes. Play with, toy with, tweak with. As witness your Android phone. Yes, quite. Um, this is a new fork of a distribution. The old fork was called, used to be called Mandrake, Mandriva, I believe is what it was last called. French-owned company. The French company kept teasing, we're going to sell this off. Uh, woo. Mm -hmm. So people just freaked out and or just, just said screw it and forked it? I believe some of the people that worked there were the first people that spurred this, okay. where they basically said, we're going to fork it ourselves. We're going to maintain it ourselves. We're going to develop it ourselves. The beauty of a fork is everything that they liked about the old one, because of the licensing scheme, they can just copy over to theirs. Mm -hmm. So they already have a good base to start with. Right. Um, this is a RPM based distribution. RPM? And I, yeah. And I will say what does that mean? this is the only, um, this is Red Hat package management system. Okay. And some people believe Red Hat package management, RPM based distros are built to break on purpose because you have to pay for support. <laughs> And it just helps the Red Hat thing roll forward. Right. I don't believe that. Right. I do I do believe the people who create RPM distributions don't adhere as tightly to maybe how the framework should be for RPMs. Because I would very often have an RPM-based distro install, go to install Pigeon. And it isn't in the repos for some godforsaken reason. Huh. I'll go download the .rpm file, go to run it. When I would go to install it, I don't read. I'm not a reader. <laughs> you know, yeah, 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 whatever. Then the computer would reboot. The computer ain't supposed to reboot on Linux. <laughs> it would reboot, and then I couldn't log into my system. Uh -huh. the, 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 like, display for graphics wouldn't pop up correctly. I.e., I would very constantly break RPM distros because I didn't read. Right. Um, now, with this distribution, they are a lot of people are calling it the Linux Mint of RPM distros. It's not. It's the closest thing available, I think, to Linux Mint for RPM di distros. And you're running it now on a couple machines? I'm running it now on two boxes, and I'll say I'm very, very pleasantly surprised at some of the features, how quick it is how quick it is to boot up, how quick it is to shut down, how quick it was to install, how it did a very good job of recognizing my network and my video card, and how I honestly, the network connection wizard for like Wi-Fi and for ethernet, gold. What very is it? Easy. Well, that's what's called, Ma, it's called Magea, M-A-G-E-I-A, -E sorry. Um, it's very easy in the network connection thing to say, disable IPv6, enable IPv4. And when you go to do the wireless, you know, WPA, type in your password, connect, remember, and it just works. I think I'm going to keep this on at least one box for a long time. Very cool. Because I really am appreciating this distribution. And it has a thing in there called the Magia Control Center. When in doubt, go there first don't try to go other places and download things right. go there first you'll be surprised at the amount of tools and utilities that are built in to the operating system to enable disable firewall you know do all these other kinds of things okay, yeah. system wide and now um how's the community How, when did they start forking this less than 12 11 months ago gotcha and i'll say the only shortcoming is not really a shortcoming it's a lack of software have ha, has been um, customly, customly. <laughs> There's a lack of software that people have customized for this distribution to make sure it works great in this distro. So, but that will be fixed with time. I really do believe that. Um, most of the software though I, I need is right there. And when it is an RPM file that I need, I just look for a open SUSE RPM. Open SUSE RPM. Double click that. If there is something that will 
possibly break something, the screen makes it very clear. You are using Python 2.7. This re, re, um, reacquires Python 2.6. Um, it basically says something to the effect of, unless you really know what you're doing, you shouldn't install this. Do you want to install? You know, it kind of makes it obvious to, uh, no, okay, no, <laughs> I, no, I won't. Um, <laughs> and I'll say if, if you want to dual boot or if you want to just play around on a spare computer, I think this distribution has a, to be honest, a really promising future. And if you don't listen to the techiegeek.com, Russ and Tracy, this is Tracy's adopted child. Um, he loves when it. it. Was, oh yeah, when it was Magia, when when it was Mandriva, it was his main go-to. He used it all the time. So um, does, he, does he like the fork then? Yes, he definitely appreciates it. He likes what I like. It always has the availability for simplicity, and then there's always it seems like an advanced button. Hmm. You click that, and it goes from simple to advanced. That's so a really you, cool way to learn an OS. Yeah, because you can really dig in there to a lot of the options, and I appreciate not treating me as if I'm stupid. Yes. If, oh god, I'm, I love, I absolutely love that, and that's why I didn't like Transformers Three. Oh, <laughs> you're such a sucker for even giving him money. Uh, you know, my brother and my, bought tickets for the whole family, and man, I, it's painful to watch a childhood memory get butchered and exploited. It hurts me. Uh, this is cool. It's it's uh, how do you pronounce it? Or Majea? It's French. I don't know what that means, but it's Magea. Magea. M A G E I A dot org is the site yeah. check it out yeah and i'll just say even if you don't have a second computer load it in a vm people seriously download yeah. it load it here's one of the things i love really stupid quick during the install it's not your typical live desktop install okay you cannot browse the internet while you're installing this is much closer to being like a windows 95 installer of you're locked into the installer complete this before you can do anything gotcha. but during the install with the same disk you can install the KDE desktop, the GNOME desktop, the OpenBox desktop, the LXDE desktop, and I think one other desktop without downloading multiple disks. I like that. Oh, yeah. That's pretty awesome. You serious? Yeah. And, yeah, and to me, GNOME wins again. I don't know why. <laughs> you love GNOME. Mm-hmm. I'm a GNOME guy. <laughs> All right, cool. Um, No emails. Now, if you want to do so, if you, I, I don't know, Doris, is there any emails? If there is, they are unbeknownst to me. Okay. If there, um, if there is, we'll collect them up and do them next week. On what? Right. The only thing I want to throw out there about interaction communications I've had, um, I will just say to anybody, if you need any kind of system to play with, two episodes ago, we went over virtualization and pre-compiled, pre-configured live distributions. Man. You can download almost anything and not configure it and just have it running for testing purposes. I think it's really cool. What do you mean, Dor? Um, like if you want a Drupal install to play with, you don't have to worry about going to a web server, creating a subdomain, doing the install, playing with it, and then cleaning it up. You can just download uh, from turnkeylinux.org a virtual Appliant. uh, a, a VMware hard disk and then you load up either VirtualBox or VMware create a new OS virtually and say use this disk and then when you boot it up it's already there it's already uh, running it's already configured that is awesome it makes playing way too easy playing and learning mm -hmm. cool man a lot of great info as usual great show door um, let's uh Tell us where people could find you and what you your, tell us about your latest product, and um, then I'll I'll give Doc another thanks before we end off. And then uh, anything else we got to talk about, we'll, we'll talk about. Cool. Um, if you are finding the initial hump of Linux hard to get over with, or if you need that little bit of extra knowledge where you're not sure how to do things, and if you learn visually, I don't learn by text. I don't learn by reading text at all. Um, over at a uh, Linux for the rest of us. There's over two hours of videos up. Dot com. 
dot com. I would really, I'm really shooting to have close to another half an hour, 40 minutes of videos up here shortly as time goes on. I got to make the content. But the goal really is, is to take people's hands and hold them through the learning process, give examples, give references, give a analogies, explain the steps to how to get tasks done. I mean, this is really, everybody has tasks they want to get done. Nobody goes in and says, well, I want to learn about the command line today. No, you always have a task you need to get done. So it's a task driven video series of how to get specific tasks done. Um, if you're really sick of getting infected or you're really sick of your cousin getting infected, buy them this video series for their birthday and install Linux on their computer and then tell them to stop calling you. <laughs> Good one. Yeah. They're selling like hotcakes. People are really liking them. Yeah, I'm blown away. So uh, take advantage of the deal while the introductory price still stands, actually. And I'm not just saying that. Um, Linux for the rest of us dot com. They're awesome videos. I think they're awesome. I watched every yep. one. Um, Dor, thank you for uh, all the goodness today. No problem. Thank you. I, honestly, I have just as much fun doing this show as I did making those videos. Oh, cool. Yeah, this is um, this is like Dor's play box. We that one might, if we didn't call it Linux for the rest of us, we'd call it like Dor's toy box. <laughs> basically yes yeah hey um doc i want to also really thank you again uh for stepping in and doing those shows gave me some breathing room it's a chance to step back take a breath um i'll be hosting the shows from now on but um check out doc's podcast at bamcast.biz if you're a computer repair technician and you want to learn some marketing tips from him and lisa hendrickson from call that girl they do a great job there so check that out and that is going to be it for Linux for the rest of us for this week. If you want to send us an email, ma send a mail at mail at podnuts.com or door to door geek at podnuts.com if you want it to go straight to door. And uh, we'll see you guys next time. Very, very cool. Very, very cool. Okay. Uh, Xbox, X kill box, man. Guy, X kill box too. I did try to invite you to Google. Plus. I never know if it's going to work or not. Because they stopped invites, but sometimes it works. Um, no pod nuts this week, guys. I'm sorry about that. Uh, I'm getting, I'm, I'm trying to get, I mean, you know, pod nuts after this show. That's what I'm saying. Um, trying to get the guest sheet back to the way it was, where it was on a wiki, where anybody could sign up, and you don't have, you don't have to go th uh, post something in the forms and wait for me to see it. Um, so podnuts.com com slash guests we'll be going through some renovations so keep your eyes peeled for that but we do need people for that show if you want to be on pod nuts hey those shows are open that's the roundtable discussion it's a fun time pod nuts daily is kind of booked up for about two months but if you mm -hmm. wanted to be on daily and you're like well, i don't want to wait two months just jump on pod nuts you could contact matt rainey directly if you just type matt at pod nuts.com say i want to be on the show um he'll put you in the pool of guests and uh, you could be on probably as soon as next week so um, take advantage of that, guys. But just so you know, we're not going to do an episode of Podnuts tonight. I'm actually going to release the uh, Makogo interview that Timster did an amazing job with um, as an episode of Podnuts as well because that was a great show. If you guys haven't checked that out, it's posted as Podnuts Daily, but it's also going to be – the identical show is going to be posted as Podnuts too because I think it's that good. <sighs> I forgot. What? I, I'm part of the Makogo – Linux beta testing team, booyah! Really? Oh yeah! Oh yeah! Oh, yeah. Get over there! Get over there! Get over, get over there. <laughs> I can't see. <laughs> I know. It works good. I gotta say, I I'm I'm uh, I'm a very biased advocate of the product. I love the fact that it's legal to use. No laws are being broke when you use it in a business environment. <clears throat> it's smooth. It's simple. It's easy. It has built-in file transfer. The only shortcoming is you cannot do unattended connections. You have to have someone at the other end to basically click OK. And that's the only thing it doesn't have. If you need on-demand support at somebody else's place, you have to use Makogo or else you are pulling your hair out. 
That's very nice of you to say, Dor. Dude, because they I, are not a sponsor. It. Oh no. And I just want everybody to know that Dor is just saying oh, no. this because he's saying this. Yeah. Me and Russ Winter, the techie geek, both give it thumbs up. And if Russ gives it a thumbs up, it's saying something. Yeah. I thumbs up all kinds of stuff. <laughs> yeah, Russ is a man. He's just he speak he speaks sagely. Um plus those I, I was really impressed with those guys when uh, Timster did the show. I was listening and um I, yeah. I, I you could tell from you know the from the speaking to founders if what their product's all about and their whole direction they want to take it. And I was impressed with it. So I hope yeah. to have them as a sponsor soon. Right. And and they were sharp. Yes. That is what I appreciated. They did not just get some marketing goombas on there to just right. talk about, right. wow, we believe our product is the most uh, product out in the market. No, they actually were able to talk about it. Yes. And they had European accents, which doesn't I know, hurt. Which just made them, which just made them sound important. <laughs> I know. I, know. I uh, immediately emailed the one guy. When I, when I was done hearing it and I told him I'm part of this podcasting network, I've been an extreme advocate of your product. I cannot thank you enough for coming on the show and for your product. Oh, good. You know, good, good, good. Oh yeah. The more, more pod nuts <laughs> feedback you guys give them, the better. Say you heard them on pod nuts. I don't know. Right. And Wilbur bear gets a big thumbs up because he was in the chat room asking very poignant questions. Oh yeah. Who else? It was Wilbur bear at uncle Al, I think. Um, I don't know if it was Uncle Hour or PC Freddy, but somebody else PC was. PC Freddy, yeah, okay. A bunch of you guys. Yeah, that Timster rode that wave. <laughs> yeah. And, and um, it was good. very, very helpful. It was very, very and, helpful. <laughs> and Timster did damn good, I got to say. Yeah. Because when, you're, cause when you're talking about something you don't know in and out, man, it is hard. It's really hard. Which, I'll tell you what. When Timster gets warmed up, there is no stopping the man. He's I on agree. Fi- he, goes, he gets on fire. Awesome. Okay. Xbox Kill Bill Freddy thingy guy. I'm downloading <laughs> the VMware image from Turnkey Linux for Drupal 6, not Drupal 7. Uh, later tonight, I'll send you an email with the IP address and everything to where you can go connect to it. Did your cat ever lay on a table so that if you move your hand, she'll fall off and she knows that? Yes. And waits for you to try to do that. Yes, or on my against my leg to where I couldn't move because I know the cat would fall. <laughs> right. So I would literally try to like take my hands, put it back in, get up without disturbing the cat <laughs> too much, and just moving out. No, the cat always gave me look like uh, you're not supposed to be moving. Right. It's like I own you is what they're saying. Mm-hmm. They're good. Yeah, they are. They always get what they want. All right, guys. Um, Thanks for tuning in live. Sorry for no pod nuts tonight. Um, hopefully, we'll have a show next week. We're we're gearing back up. So, you know, we're gearing back up. So, pod nuts is going to be continuing strong. So, hopefully, we'll have something for you.